All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to your favorite class, RAR. I've kept up my little lecture slide here today because you have a student submitted beam today. This is submitted by Mr. Matt Tarshala. Good job, Matt, RAR. If you too submit memes, you might see them here. This one hits pretty close to home. I don't know about you guys, but when I went to, or when I went to engineering school, I thought, man, I'm gonna become an engineer. I'm gonna build stuff. That's all I'm gonna do. It's gonna be awesome. And then you realize you have to do like 99% of your time spent on math and equations. And then you get sad. But later on, once you join a company, you do get to build stuff. Hopefully with composites, rawr. Okay. So submit me some more memes. These are great. Keep them coming. Uh, announcements uh, for the class, uh, your homework on Fracture, which is what we're discussing right now over this coming week. It's going to be due on Friday, so that's posted. You should probably be able to make your way through number one for sure, uh, after today, number two, um, and probably after Wednesday, number three. All right, so we're going to finish up um, kind of general discussion of uh, testing of polymeric materials, and then we'll actually go into composite testing today. Uh, mode one for sure with an example problem, and then on Wednesday we'll talk about mode two. And I think Wednesday we'll also talk a lot about the cool stuff that people are trying to do these days to increase fracture toughness. So things like rubber toughening, things like z-pinning, like a lot of just state-of-the-art research that I think is really cool. Um, so that's kind of what we got planned or going on for this particular week. All right. So if there's no further questions, let's um, let's dive back into it. All right. Let's kind of remind ourselves where we were since it's been a been such a long weekend. It's actually a really nice weekend out there. Hopefully you guys got outside, but not by anybody else. All right. So fracture. Remember our general sample that you had in your mind should look something like this. And we're loading this guy up with some load P. And this has some initial crack length A0. And what's going to happen? is something like this, where you have displacement, x-axis, load, usually denoted by p on the y-axis. And we could have two sort of different types of failure. We could either have stick slip or stable crack propagation. So let's here draw the load displacement for stick slip. All right, if that's the case, we load up, we load up, we load up, we load up. We hit some point where we can't handle it anymore. Our material is going to fail. So it does that, and we have this like release of energy, uh, and we lose a bunch of energy to that crack propagation. Okay, so we're loading up, and we propagate that crack that amount of length. All right, maybe we load up again, load up again, load up again, and now we have another failure event that looks like this, where we're, we've released some load, and that's corresponding to that additional crack length, so on and so forth. All right, so we looked at this, where we have multiple different individual events. The amount of energy that we recovered is the amount of energy contained in this particular triangle here. So this is your elastic energy that you've recovered, is UE. And we also talked about looking at the individual amount of energy associated with each fracture event. So with each fracture event, we have the corresponding energy that is contained in these triangles. So this is the energy of fracture event number one. So this here is like D1. And then here, this is the energy associated with Fracture event number two, so this area is something like a D2. Right. And if we have multiple events, many, many events, we could have a D3, a D4, a D5, so on and so forth. All right. And we calculated what the energy is associated with each one of those individual discrete events. We calculated that as DI is equal to one half delta I P I minus minus P I plus. All right, where PI minus is the amount of load on the sample right before failure, and PI plus is the amount of load on the sample right after failure. So here is something like PI minus, and here we have like PI plus right before and right after load. So that's how we calculate the amount of energy that's lost during each one of these individual events. And 
crack advance is delta A of the i failure event is whatever the crack length was before the failure. So delta A i minus. Uh, sorry, I got that backwards. Whatever we end up with after the failure minus whatever we had before the failure. So delta A i minus is your total crack advance for that particular uh, segment. All right, then with sample thickness. Uh, equal to B, where B is the variable that is the thickness of this particular guy. Here is B. Then our critical strain energy release rate of the ith event, then G C I equals this D I over delta A I, or this is more typically seen as something like uh, delta I. PI minus minus PI plus all on two delta AI times B. All right, so that's kind of your general equation for calculating the critical strain energy release rate of the ith failure event inside of this stick slip. All right, so that's your stick slip, pure polymer. We could also have a situation where we're looking at stable crack propagation. So if we're stable, what's going to happen is, again, you have this same sort of sample here. Some initial crack length here again, A0. And here now your low displacement curve looks a little bit different. We're here, we're loading up, loading up, loading up. And now we don't have these large individual discrete events. What happens is you have uh, much smaller uh, events that you can't really track how far the crack is growing with each individual event. Because the crack is like growing such a little amount with each individual event, you can't really see how much it's growing. So what this ends up looking like is sort of a continuous line of failure where you have a bunch of these little events, bunch of these little events, bunch of these little events. So you end up somewhere down here and then you can unload back to your original condition. So here's your loading, here's your unloading. So in this situation, your crack is growing slowly with some stable crack propagation. So it's kind of growing slowly, growing slowly as you go. All right, so that's uh, your general idea. In this situation, the energy associated with fracture can be determined by looking at any two particular points on the curve where you know what the crack length is at that particular point. So let's say we have some point up here. Yeah, let's do this in blue, make it a little distinctual. And so you have this point here, which is like the displacement delta I with load PI. And then you have some point down here, which is like the displacement delta J and load PJ. And these have associated crack lengths, which are something like the crack length here is AI, the crack length here is AJ. All right, so some distance between the two different points as the crack is advanced from AI to AJ. In that situation, the energy associated with fracture to get from what is point number one to point number two is the energy encompassed by the following area, and that is something like this. So the area in this general segment here is the area associated with that particular fracture. So here's your fracture energy. From I to J. All right. So in this particular situation, you can calculate again, kind of using this triangle area sort of formula that we had shown before for what is the area underneath, uh, the area encompassed by this particular um, fracture event and can determine that for any particular uh, two points on this sort of low displacement curve where you know the various cracks here and here, say I know what the crack length is at AI, I know what the crack length is at AJ, I pick off the corresponding load and displacement to determine what the critical strain energy release rate is between those two particular points. And we find that in this particular situation, the critical strain energy release rate is something like one half 
one over here's that b times delta a again so b delta a i all multiplied by what is p i delta j minus p j delta i so this is your critical strain energy release rate if you have stable propagation of these materials. Right. We hadn't really talked about composites yet. We had kind of framed this all with polymeric materials. And now it's time to talk about composites and how we actually do composites testing. So Everything that I've kind of shown here before is generic. It doesn't have any relationship with any um, particular material or testing method, or we could have done mode two or whatever, all right? So up till now, it's been sort of generic for any material. All right, so now let's get into composites testing. All right, now each of the different fracture modes that I talked about before, remember mode one is Pac-Man mode, rawr. Mode two is the sliding mode, and then mode three is like the trouser tear mode. Each one of these modes, when you're testing composite materials, has a specific test geometry and a specific sample associated with that particular test. So I'll just spell this out. Each mode of fracture has a specific geometry and test setup. to evaluate the critical strain energy release rate. OK, so I'll spell those out, but they are here um, for mode one. The test geometry they use is called the double cantilever beam specimen. Okay, I'll spell them out and then we'll talk about each one of these samples in, in pretty good detail. All right, the double cantilever beam specimen. There's a mode two, which is the, there's a couple different ones, but the most common is the uh, edge notch flexure, edge notch or end notch. And then mode three is usually called the trouser tear specimen, like I've kind of alluded to. There are also ways to load up a sample in mixed mode, meaning you have a little bit of loading in the mode one direction and a little bit of loading in the mode two direction. So if you thought about, you know, a crack that you were trying to open, you could be pulling on it, you know, in the mode one fashion while also shearing it in the same way. All right. So this would be like a mode one and mode two at the same time where I'm pulling and shearing at the same time. So this sort of motion here, that's called a mixed mode fracture test. And those sample geometries are variable. All right. So what we're going to focus on this in this class are these two guys. Uh, these things are interesting, but this mode three test is really not very common. All right, that type of loading is not seen all that often. All right, so mode three testing is pretty rare in the community. Um, mixed mode testing is something that's a little bit more common, but not nearly as much as what you'll see for mode one and mode two. 
Okay, so those are the tests that we're going to talk about today. Each one of these sample types, the double cantilever beam specimen, the edge notch flexure specimen, and the associated tests that go along with them have all been standardized. All right, so uh, the mode one, I'll say. Just for short, this is DCB. And the edge notch flexure. usually seen as E and F. Testing methods and geometries have been standardized. All right. I've uploaded a few standards to Blackboard in the lecture tab. All right. These standards are expensive. So if you're going to go and work in industry, you would have to pay like 100 bucks for each one of these standards. So my advice to you is download those standards, put them on your machine, and keep them in a safe place. Because generally, people don't have access to them. So put them on your machine, keep them in a safe place. If you're ever going to do composite testing later in your life, you'll be thankful that you have these particular standards. All right. So uh, ASTM standards. All right, so let's look at in a little bit more detail what this mode one test is. So first, the mode one test. And remember, this is our double cantilever beam, DCB for short. All right. So let's look at what this testing actually looks like. Here is a picture of one of the samples that is being tested in mode one. All right, nice to actually have picture. So this is a 16 layer, eight harness satin weave, uh, nine ounce per yard squared uh, composite. All right, that's the general idea. So here, this is the general geometry of the double cantilever beam specimen. It has sort of this, uh, you know, you do your layup, you have some Teflon film that's in between the, the middle sections of the particular layup. All right, so here's what a picture of this might look like, a schematic. All right, so you bond on these hinges to this laminated structure. So here's your composite. Uh, this is your composite here. And then there's this pre-crack that you incorporate in the manufacturing process. Usually that's done with like some Teflon insert or some thin plastic insert that's heat resistant. If you remember that film that I laid down on my aluminum plate when we manufactured our composite, like on the second day of class, that film might be a film that you would incorporate between like layers eight and nine, which would be the middle of this particular composite to incorporate that pre-crack. All right. We see that Teflon still remaining in this particular sample here. So you sort of see this like blue region. That is the Teflon that's actually still inside of the piece. So originally for this particular sample, you can sort of see that it's being loaded in this direction in this direction. You can see for this particular sample that this line right here was where the pre-crack originated. This was the original length of the crack for this particular sample. And this thing has now been pulled up and pulled down such that the crack started here and has propagated all this entire direction until we see this is where our crack front is on this particular sample now. Okay, so these are what these like double cantilever beam specimens look like. All right, I actually have one here, so I'm going to put you guys on my camera for a second. All right, this is actually what it looks like in reality. Uh, a little bit difficult to maybe see. I'm trying my best with this uh, camera situation, but you can sort of see kind of on uh, what would be your right side, the darkened area here. That is where the Teflon is inserted into the piece. And this sample that I hold here is actually a six layer. 
uh, woven composite. So that Teflon that you see there in that particular portion of the sample, that Teflon is uh, between layers three and four for this particular piece. All right, so you see that darkened area, that's because the Teflon is in there. All right, and we see here now like the piano hinges that are sort of bonded onto this side of the sample here. So here are the piano hinges. They got like this ability to rotate this bottom piece or whatever. And the idea is that if I pull on this, it will open up that crack. So hopefully you can sort of see that guy opening up a little bit. And this is like your Pac-Man mode, right? This is your mode one. So it'd be nicer if I could pass this around, but uh, I can't really pass this around to you guys or you know, mail it one person at a time. <laughs> um, but hopefully you kind of get the idea and you can kind of see what's going on there. So that is called a double cantilever beam specimen. It's about one inch in uh, width. And here it's about, this guy is maybe seven inches long or something like that. Uh, most of them are in that general size range. All right, so this image here, this is from ASTM standard. All right. So this helps you define like what are the terms in this particular piece. All right. What is the thickness H? What is the load P? How do you put these together? So on and so forth. And we see the variable B here, which is like the width of the sample into the page, so to say. So when you're testing this guy, you might see crack growth from the side that looks something like this as we load it up. So this is kind of a cartoon image of what you might expect in a typical test. You start with some initial crack length, A naught, and as you're pulling this guy with the value of P, as you see here, the crack propagates some amount delta A. Right. This delta here is this crosshead displacement. It's the amount that you're like opening the sample. So there's your delta. So when you're calculating your GC values, you've got the variables that you need, like delta P, delta A, and the width into the sample B. So this is kind of a, a side view of what this particular sample looks like. Right. Now let's actually look at what the ASTM standard uh, actually is and looks like. So I can sort of pull this up so you can see it. So if you're ever gonna do kind of this fracture testing in the future, you probably want to follow the guidelines that are outlined in this particular standard. Okay, so this is the current ASTM standard, D5528, my favorite. Standard test for mode one interlaminar fracture toughness of unidirectional fiber reinforced composites. That's exactly what we're talking about. So it has some general scope. It talks about some of the terminology, the vocabulary. Um, here you see something like mode one interlaminar fracture toughness G1C. So here in units of something like energy per crack opening area. Right, so this is sort of the things that we've been talking about the last couple of lectures. And you see some of the images associated. So here's like the sample geometry and what it kind of looks like. So you create your composite and you put some sort of item to grab the composite with. Here's the piano hinge, for instance, on the sample that I showed, but you can also put like these loading blocks onto it. So you put pins into it and pull it that way. Uh, but the general idea is you need some sort of pin structure to, to rotate about while you're pulling on it. So these various definitions of length, the length of the sample, the width, uh, some, so on and so forth. So these standards contain basically all the, energy, all the uh, information associated with these testing. So here we see G is like one on B times DUDA, where DU is the change in area of the energy, right? So DU is like the amount of energy that was released, DA is the crack advantage, and then B is the width of the sample. So again, here, another calculation of the G variable. Uh, using things that we've sort of talked about. So they go into a lot of depth here, even as much as saying like, what is the specific size of the sample that is required? How do you test this exactly? What sort of machine, what displacement uh, do you use? Like the rate of displacement. Uh, here are the specimens dimensions. So they shall be at least 125 millimeters long and nominally from 20 to 25 millimeters in width. So when I hold up this particular sample here, this sample adheres to that particular guideline. It's at least five inches long, and it's between 20 and 25 millimeters in width. All right, so it follows this particular guideline. It tells you how thick the laminate should be, everything. All right, so if you ever need to do fracture testing, this is like your, your holy grail. All right, you should have this in your hand when you're like designing the sample and testing the samples. All right, so that's kind of like your mode one fracture testing with actual composites.
All right, a couple more pictures that I think are kind of cool. So, more pictures. This gives you a little better view of like how the crack might propagate if you're looking on it from the side or from above. So if you've got this sample and you're testing it, and you're looking at it from the side or from above, it might look something like this. So a couple of things that we can point out is this is obviously like uh, a change in time. So as we're opening this particular sample, opening, 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 you can sort of see how the crack is propagating. One thing that I do want you to notice is that on the side of the samples, you see tick marks. And here there's five millimeter spacing. So what is the reasoning for those particular tick marks? Okay, well, the reasoning is I need to track the crack propagation during testing. I need to know how far the crack has advanced between the loading values that I have. This is helpful for me to calculate my GC values, okay? So the way that this test works is I'm watching how this crack here is growing, right? Once that crack passes through each one of these individual lines, I have a corresponding like delta I and pi associated with the crack passing over each one of those individual you know tick marks and so if my crack advances five millimeters i get delta i pi advances another five millimeters i get delta i plus one pi plus one so on and so forth until you sort of construct all the values of delta i and pi associated with the crack advances of delta a i to calculate all the gc values accordingly all right. So we see again, this crack is propagating farther, crack is propagating farther, so on and so forth. So this is viewing it from the side, and you can also view the sample like from above. All right. So here is my crack length here. It's propagating generally this direction. As I'm pulling the sample open, what happens is you're lighting the sample from below, and because composites have this general like uh, light passes through them if they're clear enough. What happens is you can track the composite or track the crack in the composite from above by shining or backlighting it, and then the crack will propagate from right to left, and you can see a noticeable difference between where the crack has advanced and where it hasn't. Okay, so this is another technique just for monitoring how the crack is advancing during the test. If you, you know, don't want to rely on like these tick marks on the side, maybe you could rely on monitoring the crack from above, potentially tracking it using some computer software, which is exactly what they're doing in this in this paper. All right. So that's the general idea for how the testing might occur. Now, data that might result. From a test like this. Might look something like the following. Where's my cursor? All right, so here's this load displacement data. This curve here, this black curve, is your load and displacement data. And then this information here is information about the crack advance as you go, right? So generally, the crack length of the sample prior to the test started at something like, I don't know if we go over to the right here, maybe the initial crack length of this sample was something like 50 millimeters. All right. So what happened in this particular sample is it's being loaded, loaded, loaded. And then once it gets to this point up here, it begins to fail. And so it begins to fail. And so we see it's kind of moving down this particular pathway and it has stable growth. Okay, so it doesn't have like the stick slick behavior, it has stable growth. And with that stable growth, we can track how the crack is moving on the sample uh, with the displacement of the actual sample itself. So we see here, these individual red lines or these red dots correspond to the five millimeter tick marks that are on the side of the sample. So as the crack propagates five millimeters, we can track where that has occurred and so here is like a five millimeter advance from the original position. 
and you can correlate that five millimeter advance with some load and displacement up here that exists. So you have your load displacement value, you have your track length value, you can calculate the GC value appropriately. All right, so that's if you're monitoring these like discrete events from the side. And so when you see this ASTM D5528, that is what they prescribe, putting these five millimeter tick marks on the side and monitoring what is the load and displacement on the sample at those various tick marks. All right. The other line that you see here, this blue line, this is this linear fit calibration. So what this is, this is the tracking of the crack in a continuous sense from above. So if you have some computer program that can monitor the crack from above, you can see where the crack is sort of in a continuous state as opposed to like this discrete state to determine where the crack is in your sample. So it would give you a more continuous fit instead of these random discrete intervals. All right. So again, we see all these various crack advances and we're correlating the value of the crack advance, which is kind of the right hand Y axis here with the load and displacement that exists at that particular time uh, to calculate the, the critical strain energy release rate values. Okay? Hopefully that sort of makes sense. All right, so if you have data like this and you've collected this data, you can then create what's known as your R curve. Remember which plots the critical strain energy release rate GC as a function of crack advance delta A. And it would look something like this. Right. <clears throat> so again, here was our initial crack length of like 50 millimeters. And then you see these individual red dots corresponding to the tick marks that are out on the side of the sample. Again, each one of these individual sort of like tick marks that is here. Come on, red. Each one of these individual tick marks corresponds to each one of these individual data points that you see here in the red. All right. So each one of those tick marks allows us to calculate a discrete value of G1C. And we can plot that as a function of the crack length as it advances. That's what we've got down here in the x-axis. This creates for us this R curve, which I talked about last time. It's plotting GC as a function of delta A. And we'll notice here that this is generally flat. Okay, that means no plasticity. and generally brittle sample, all right, which is what a composite material is. All right, so we see this flatness to the curve and the average of all of these values is what would be reported. So this is the average GC. For this sample, you'd have a G1C of something about like 410 or something joules per meter squared. So this is what the data might actually look like coming off. So I want to go through an exercise that looks similar to this, where we have some continuous load displacement curve, something that looks like this. And you have individual discrete data points where you know what the values are of the load and displacement as you go across certain crack propagations. Right? So I want to kind of go through this exercise as well. The example problem here is, is coming from page 17 of the notes. So I'll just say is you have a unidirectional GCB sample. Um, <clears throat> with initial crack length. Of 25 millimeters. All right, so that's my A0 value. And following load displacement. This is going to look a little bit weird, but I'll talk you through it. <clears throat> 
So in this particular sample, what the authors did is they loaded up, crack propagated a little bit, and then they unloaded all the way back to zero. Then they loaded up along the same line, crack propagates, then they unloaded. Loaded up, crack propagates, unloaded, so on and so forth. And each one of these individual marks is five millimeters of displacement. So here, delta A equals five millimeters. Uh, five millimeters between these two guys of crack advance and so on and so forth. So you get the idea is that every single time that the crack propagates five millimeters, they were unloading and reloading the sample. Right. So if sample is 20 millimeters width, uh, let's approximate. GC value and create the R curve. All right, so what we need to do is we basically need to look at each one of these individual points and figure out at each one of these points what is delta I and what is PI at each one of those individual points, and then what is the associated crack advance at that particular location, all right? So that's the general idea here. So we need to sort of formulate a table for each one of these critical values. So we could break this down and sort of look at this particular graph. And could see that like, uh, sorry, it's, uh, this is uh, the value 0 0.25 millimeters, 320 Newtons. So I'm pulling off the displacement here and the load here for each one of these individual points, right? This guy is like 0.5 millimeters all the way down to here, 290 newtons, so across to here. You get the general idea. So you can populate a chart that looks like this from the data here. We're told that at each one of these turnaround points, we've advanced five millimeters. So you create a vector where you have a bunch of five millimeter increments, and then the corresponding turnaround points, you can sort of pick off the graph. So these are like x, y points of the data that's on this particular graph. All right. So you can populate a chart that looks like this from the data that you have here. All right. So if you populate that graph, populate that chart, you'll have something that looks like this. Now with each one of these values, I could calculate an associated G1C value between various entries, okay? So I need two points to calculate the GC values, all right? So what you can do is look at point I and point J, get a value. Then point J and point J plus one, get a value. Point J plus one, point J plus two, get a value, so on and so forth. So you can, uh, again, use the equation that we had showed before for the stable propagation which remember looked something like this. To determine the GC of those individual values. Okay, so you have delta AI between each particular point, it's five millimeters. You have the width of the sample, B, told us 20 millimeters. And then these various values come from the values that you tabulate in this particular chart. All right, that's the general idea there. All right, if we do that, the following results. <clears throat> 
All right, so we see here the calculation of G1C. This first one doesn't have a value because again, you need at least two points for this to work. All right, so these two points give me this particular value. These two points together give me this particular value, so on and so on and so on, you get the general idea. And we see that we then create this vector of the GC values, and we're gonna plot that vector of GC values against the crack length of the sample. So this here is the R curve, which plots that critical strain energy release rate as a function of this crack advance. Right. So again, ultimately plotting this vector against this vector. For a perfect situation, if this composite was perfectly elastic and all things were behaving well, uh, you would get a flat line. So that's what we're trying to represent here. Though this sample, the data is a little bit noisy and you do end up with a little bit of like strange behavior. Um, the way that you would work this is you would just say that, okay, there's just some noise in the sample. The values are relatively low. So maybe there's just some strange things going on with this particular sample. But we would say that generally we could approximate this as a flat line and create or come up with some average G1C value of about 31 joules per meter squared. All right, so that's the general methodology here for these particular types of tests. Okay, um, that'll be it for today. Uh, kind of a lot of just talking about experimentation, looking at experimental data, and sort of how we would resolve these critical strain energy release rate values from actual data. Uh, so that's gonna be it for today. I'll hang out for questions, and uh, if there's no questions, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Make sure to give one and two a try on the homework now.